Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. In this video, I'd like to talk to you about side effects, potential side effects of inhalers. And this is a video I wanted to, to do for a long time, but I've been avoiding it slightly. The main reason being that, first of all, I do think that I need to be careful how I communicate things, because I still believe that inhalers are some of the safest medications that one can take, especially for respiratory conditions such as asthma or COPD, and we don't really have much better or safer alternative in many situations. So that's why sometimes I need to be careful when I make a video about side effects, because I know some people will focus too much on the side effects and less on the potential and the benefits to control very very serious conditions so putting that nuance out there just before i begin and just the second thing that i'd like to say is that obviously if you are having any issues with your treatments whether it's an inhaler a tablet or if you're worried about interactions with your current treatments or if your condition is not well controlled if you're suffering with a lot of problems respiratory wise i think you should talk to your doctor just ask for their advice, talk to them, see what's going on, because it may be something else. It may not be the medication, it may be something else going on with your health. People can sometimes develop new conditions, and it's important to just be aware of what's going on. Make sure you're being treated well for all the, the problems uh, that you might have health-wise. So, that being said, I'd like to just get into this uh, video, in which I'd like to maybe cover the main types of medications that we find in inhalers and what these can cause. And potentially to give you at the end another unusual risk that maybe people don't think about and it's to do mostly with not reading the instructions correctly on an inhaler or maybe not understanding how to use it correctly and what can happen, which is very interesting. So uh, that being said, I would like to first start by saying that a lot of side effects do occur when, when people have poor inhaler technique, so they, they are not able to use the inhaler correctly. So this is very important. And I know it may sound as if I'm accusing someone, but I'm not. It can be difficult, even for me, when I learned how to use the inhalers, because I had to do it for my job to show patients and things like that. It can be hard. It can be hard even for someone who doesn't have a respiratory condition to use these things well and to synchronize breathing with inhaling. It, it can be tricky. So obviously there are so many types of inhalers available on the market today that I think it's important to just work with your doctor to find the right device for you, a device that you can use well. And the best piece of advice is to always take the inhaler with you to your future consultations and show your doctor how you're actually using it because they can give you some direct feedback, observe how you, your technique and just correct it if it's necessary so that you're getting the optimal benefits from your inhaler and minimizing side effects. So that being said, let's uh, split the medications that we can find in inhalers in three groups because basically there's three main types of medications that you may find in these inhaler devices and there's quite a lot of them, right? So just holding couple of up there right so uh, we do have bronchodilators on one side and we have two types of medication two classes of medication in that box and we have inhaled corticosteroids which is a third type of medication that can be found in inhalers you may have inhalers that contain only one type of medication or two or three so we have triple combination inhalers nowadays that have two bronchodilators two medications that open up the airways and an inhaled corticosteroid. These can be now find, found in a triple combination inhal inhaler. So we can start maybe with the simplest inhalers, things like Ventolin. So Ventolin is uh, also called salbutamol. So basically that's the pharmacological term for the medication that we find in the blue inhalers, salbutamol. So salbutamol is something called a beta-2 agonist, a short-acting beta-2 agonist. You may find it, if you're reading any of the guidelines, as a SABA, S-A-B-A. SABA means short-acting beta agonist. So salbutamol is one, and we also have other examples of long-acting beta agonists, so things like formoterol or salmeterol, which can be found generally in combination inhalers together usually with a corticosteroid, with an inhaled corticosteroid. And these, sometimes you may find the acronym LABA, L-A-B-A. So LABA means long-acting beta agonist. Now these two, uh, these type of, this class of medication usually leads to side effects in uh, people who take too much of the medication. This is usually where this problem lies. So, of course, some people may be more sensitive to the effects of the medication, but generally what can happen is that if you take maybe too many puffs of Ventolin, whether because you like to take it or because most likely you are very breathless and you're trying to control your medication, 
uh, your sorry your symptoms and you're struggling to inhale correctly you may need to use more puffs than necessary so you ingest some of the medication that can cause side effects and because it acts as a little bit of a stimulant it can lead to people getting some jitters so feeling as if you've had too much tea too much coffee and this can be particularly problematic in people who have heart conditions so if you already have a heart condition if you're already struggling with abnormal heart rhythms things like that it can have a stimulant effect on the heart and cause more palpitations and potentially some more um, adverse um, heart rhythms so it's important if you are getting a lot of palpitations when you're using your inhalers especially if you're using a lot of them make sure that you mention that to your doctor. Also, another thing that can happen, especially in people who already have a low potassium due to maybe taking water tablets or diuretics, or maybe they have some other issues related to heart disease, using a lot of uh, these beta agonists can lead to a lower potassium level in your blood. So obviously it's usually a problem in people who already have a low potassium level due to some other reasons or there can be some medication interactions but it's important to keep that in mind and then maybe your doctor will advise you on that regard but generally of course i may be maybe not covering i may not be covering all the side effects here but for these this class of medication things like salbutamol for motorol so things that open up the airways but are part of this class this is more or less what we would see there is another type of bronchodilator, another medication that keeps the airways open, which is called muscarinic antagonists. So these, this is another class of medication. You may see this sometimes mentioned as LAMA, long-acting muscarinic antagonists, or SAMA, SAMA, short-acting muscarinic antagonists. And here we have examples of medications such as iprotropium or atrovent, and other things like teotropium, which is found in Spiriva, or Brautus, and glycopyronium, which is found in some other combination inhalers, or potentially. These generally, again, they tend to open up the airways, but they can sometimes lead to some other problems as well. So obviously rare, so I wouldn't put this at the top of the list of potential side effects, but they can happen. So sometimes you can get a little bit of a dry mouth, Sometimes people may get some digestive symptoms with these inhalers. It's important to just mention this to your doctor. Maybe an abnormal taste in your mouth. They're quite rare, these side effects, but it's important to just make a note of them and to man discuss with your doctor whether they're manageable in your case or not. Also, there are some individuals who may have some pre-existing conditions in which we need to be a bit more careful when we use uh, things like Atrovent or other similar inhalers that contain things like that, so things like Spiriva and such. So, for example, someone who has glaucoma, if you know that you've got this condition called glaucoma, it's important to be careful, especially when you're using, using things like Atrovent, which comes as a puffer, so it can spray medication, to not spray it in your eye, because it can lead to worsening problems with the glaucoma, which is an eye condition. Also, the iprotropium uh, can be found as a solution that can be nebulized. So that's, while it's not exactly an inhaler, it's important to try to make sure that you're not nebulizing the solution into your eye. Again, people who have heart issues, have heart rhythm abnormalities, heart failure, you just need to be a little bit careful and mention this to your doctor uh, just to keep an eye on things. And that's it. If you are getting palpitations, if you're feeling unwell when you're using this type of medication, do mention it to your doctor. See what alternatives there may be. The other thing would be in, uh, in men who have enlarged prostates. So this can be an issue, especially if you've uh, previously had some, uh, some obstructions leading to urinary retention, so unable to go to the toilet basically to, to pee. That, that would be an issue. So just mention it to your doctor. If you are prone to getting urinary retention, Mention it to your, doc to your doctor to see whether um, this is a problem while you're, whilst you're on the inhaler. Many people do not have a problem with this. They can still take the inhaler if they have a prostate problem. But it's just something to keep in mind and discuss it with your doctor. Now, this is uh, the bronchodilators. We've covered the two main classes, of course. There may be some other potential side effects you may read in the package insert. I'm just mentioning some of the more important ones. When we talk about corticosteroid inhalers or inhaled corticosteroids, or you may find this acronym as ICS, so inhaled corticosteroids, these are very commonly used. Examples would include things like budesonide, beclomethazone, fluticasone, 
these are potential medications that you might find on their own in inhalers or potentially in combination inhalers with a bronchodilator or with two bronchodilators. You might have them in triple combinations as well. Now, inhaled corticosteroids do not carry the same side effect profile as taking steroid tablets, corticosteroid tablets. It's completely different because the dose that we use in inhalers is extremely small. It's by orders of magnitude smaller than what you would have in tablets. So, so this is why it's very unlikely that you would ha get side effects such as you, you would see with tablet steroids, so things like high blood pressure, diabetes, etc. It's very, very unlikely because the dose that you would be taking is extremely small. You're just inhaling that low dose of steroid directly in the airways, on the inner lining of the airways. So that helps uh, just control the asthma, inflammation, for example, and it's fine. But generally, people who use inhaled corticosteroids need to be mindful of the fact that the solution or the powder from the inhaler can get stuck at the back of the throat. And this is where people can develop hoarse voice. They can develop an oral candidiasis, which is a type of a fungal infection at the back of the throat. This can happen when using corticosteroid inhalers. So what uh, we suggest generally is that after you've taken the inhaler to just take a bit of water rinse your mouth, gargle and spit it out because that generally tends to take care of this problem and get rid of that solution or powder that's been left at the back of the throat that's not doing anything to treat you but can lead to side effects. So this is one way to minimize side effects. The other thing would be to, of course, use good inhaler technique. And if you are still struggling to inhale your medication, to consider using a spacer device, which is something like this. It's basically like a, a big bottle thing. There are different types that you can use. I don't have another one handy here, unfortunately. But basically, they, they come in different shapes and sizes, but you connect the inhaler to the end, spray the medication inside and inhale from the other end. So this generally takes care of the large particles that can be sprayed out from the inhalers, which deposit on the inside of the spacer device, but you're just inhaling the small fine mist that tends to find its way deep inside the lungs where it needs to act, rather than st sticking to the top side of the airway because the bigger droplets tend to deposit themselves quicker in the airway so on the you know throat throat voice box it's at back of the mouth etc while the small particles tend to go down deep in the airways where they need to act so again just like i said trying to use good inhaler technique and rinsing your mouth after you've used the inhaler can help reduce the side effects from inhaled corticosteroids but taking inhaled corticosteroids can be very effective at treating very serious conditions such as severe asthma so it's really important to work with your doctor and find the right way to administer these if you need to the other th thing would be here i would just mention this but there is a bit of a controversy here so please bear with me when I say this. So in children who have uh, asthma, so childhood asthma, we may need to use inhaled corticosteroids to treat their condition. And it's quite important to know that there are some reports that you may read about, about slowed growth rates in uh, children who use a lot of um, inhaled corticosteroids. I think there's a bit of a controversy here. While statistically there is some uh, plausibility to that claim, and potentially it could be the case, it's also important to balance that against the risk of having uncontrolled asthma as a child, because that would mean that maybe that child will be in and out of hospital a lot and actually will receive stronger steroids, corticosteroids, as tablets or injections, because we're trying to control very severe asthma. So the cumulative dose, the total dose of inhaled of corticosteroid administered to that child may be higher in someone who has uncontrolled asthma. So this is just something that I wanted to mention because it's quite hard to figure out what the best solution is here. Of course, we you would work with the pediatrician to administer the lowest possible concentration of uh, steroids that controls the asthma. But having uncontrolled asthma as a child is also a risk factor for a lot of other problems. So uh, like, I, like you, you probably understand what I'm trying to say here is that there is no clear cut answer in any situation. So for adults, for children, we need to balance the risks against the benefits. But generally, inhalers have a very, very positive benefit risk ratio especially compared to other types of treatment that we would have to use for respiratory conditions. So it's been a revolution really in this regard because previously in the 70s, early 80s, we hardly had anything to treat respiratory disease with. And actually asthma nowadays, it's, mu it's much better controlled. COPD is much better controlled since the, uh, the advent of these inhalers. And the final risk I'd like to tell you about is 
something that can happen when we don't read the instructions well. And this is something that obviously your doctor may tell you, but sometimes you, they may not be able to predict all the scenarios. And I'd just like to read you one thing that, that could be interesting. So I'm talking here about an inhaler called Braltus, but by all means, this could be applied to other types of inhalers as well. So this is a report from the MHRA, which in the UK is the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. So a bit like the FDA, like the EMA. So basically there's this. So the MHRA has received reports of cases where a Brautus capsule has been inhaled from the mouthpiece into the back of the throat, resulting in coughing and risking aspiration or airway obstruction. Patients should be trained in the correct use of their inhaler and told to store capsules in the screw top bottle provided, never in the inhaler, and to always check the mouthpieces clear before inhaling. So what do I mean by this? So basically, I'll show you with the Brautus inhaler, but also this can apply to other types of inhalers as well, by all means. So with the Brautus inhaler, it's one of these ones where you need to put a capsule in, pierce the capsule, and then inhale. So you, generally you have this cap that you, that you basically open. So it goes like this, it opens up, and then you have a mouthpiece and then you flip this back and there is a, a little hole here where a small capsule that you take from a, a little pill case, you, you take it out and what you do is then you would put it in inside here. So I, I don't know if you've seen that, I'll do it again. But basically it, there are different types of capsule inhalers. So Spiriva is the same. So you take this one, you put it in and then when you close this, you have to just press on this button, pierce the capsule, and then there is a grill that keeps the capsule inside the mouthpiece. So then you inhale. But what happened in this report is that someone probably didn't read the instructions well and took this capsule and put it in the mouthpiece because it can go in there. So don't do this at home because then you would inhale it to the back of your throat. So again, this is something that can happen when we don't understand the instructions well. And I'm not trying to say this is a bad design for breathless. It's a great inhaler. There are some others which are similar. I'm not trying to, to name and shame brands. I'm, I'm very transparent with all the inhalers that I show because I don't endorse any over the other. I don't think there's such a thing as a, the best inhaler or the worst inhaler. But with Ventolin as well. So if you think about it, look at this. So you've got a little inhaler and it's got a little cap here. If you take the cap off and you just put this in your pocket, maybe it just collects lint and other things that go in this mouthpiece. And you can have, I, I've seen patients who, who've come to clinic and showed me inhalers which looked atrocious. They've really, I don't know where they've kept them. So you imagine if you don't check the mouthpiece and there's something in there, when you inhale, it will go to the back of your throat. So that's again, an unusual risk. So please check the mouthpiece before you use inhalers, check, for potential, you know, some other things that may be going on. Read the instructions, consult with your doctor, show them how you're using it, make sure you're using them correctly because you can tend to minimize most of the side effects or have hardly any at all with using inhalers. So I hope you found this helpful. It's a bit of a longer video, but I just wanted to cover several things. Again, as my conclusion as a chest doctor, I would say that inhalers still remain some of the safest medications that we have for treating respiratory disease. And I just like to emphasize the fact that good inhaler technique and knowing what to expect is probably gonna lead to the most optimal benefits. So any issues that you have, please discuss them with your healthcare providers. Don't just discount inhalers from the get-go, despite potentially having occasional side effects. They are great medications that have actually led to great progress in this field. Hopefully this was helpful. If you have further questions, do drop them in the comment section below. And like I said, I, I struggle sometimes to make these videos where I explain side effects because I know that not everything applies to every patient and it can be difficult online to, to present this in a very balanced and neutral way. Thank you very much for watching. All the best and good health.